thank you all for coming. It's such an, it's always nice to see such a, a big crowd. And I just wanted to mention that, let's see, it's a quarter to eight, and I think the Raiders start playing at, at eight o'clock, right? Yeah, over in Pasco? <laughs> so anyway, they're in the NWAC championship game, so they'll be there for a couple days playing games. So they started eight o'clock against Everett, so just kind of want to wish them well. I also wanted to have the um, past distinguished faculty, if you're, you know, been a distinguished faculty, if you could stand up. Come, I know there's several of you here. <laughs> and we also have our, um, the chancellor, Michelle, is, is here, and the presidents of both colleges, Denise and Colette. So thank you guys for coming. And I want to give, I want you guys to give a really, really big round of applause for the, for our caterers, Lancers, because there was a little on the, on the, the slip, you know, that we fill out the order form. Well, we didn't notice that it actually said MPR on it for location, which stands for multi-purpose room, which is actually in Puyallup. And so it wasn't until Linda and I came over here on Wednesday and we were, we were talking to the people in the, in, that run our kitchen and she's going, I don't have a dinner here on Saturday night. And we're thinking, no, wait a minute, what? <laughs> and so, so they got it all organized. They had all kinds of other stuff going on today, but they managed to get it all switched over and, and thank goodness the people were here and the food wasn't over in the other <laughs> campus. <laughs> I, I know we're all one big district, but having the food on one campus and the people on the other one would not have worked out real well. <laughs> so I'd like to invite um, Pat Lewis up. She is the president of... He. 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, that's okay. We haven't met. I'm Pat, by the way. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Pat. <laughs> I don't know. I guess because, you know, I've got a cousin, Pat, and she's a female, so I tend to, you know... <laughs> So he is the president of the Pierce College Foundation, and they're always very generous in um, supplying an award um, for our distinguished faculty. So Ted, if you want to come up here as well. Thank you. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. It's my pleasure to be here and honor the great work of the Pierce College faculty and recognize Professor Ted Wood. As a president of the Pierce College Foundation Board, I'm very aware of the difference the faculty make in providing excellent education to our students and enriching the lives of our students. It's the honor and privilege of the Pierce College Foundation to present Professor Wood with a check for $1,000 in recognition for his dedication to students and his quality teaching. Congratulations. Thank you. For you. All right, thank you. We can all go home now. Yeah, not likely. <laughs> I, I just want to say that I've always been, Ted was actually a division chair when I got here, and he was, so he was on my tenure committee as the division chair, and then, and then we kind of switched around, and, and Nancy Barker became my, the division chair, and so then she was already on the committee, fortunately for me, so they just like switched places. But the thing that impressed me most about Ted was that he, he already knew French, and then he decided he wanted to learn Spanish, so he started this little group, took one year of Spanish, and, and then he got better than me, and I took, I don't know, like eight years or something. So, he's, so it's not just science that he does well. And, um, but we have another chemistry expert coming up here, Megan, who, Megan Hess, who is one of our newer faculty in the chemistry department, and she's going to introduce Ted. Oh, thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. I can't express how exciting this is. I have known Ted for many, many years. We go way back, and I've known him in multiple professional capacities, so it's, it's kind of an exciting thing to be able to celebrate with him tonight. 
Um, Ted is my colleague in the chemistry department. Um, since uh, 13 years ago, when I started as a part-time instructor, he was always willing to give help and to give advice and to answer questions, um, never hesitated, and I always really appreciated that about him. Uh, we have also been next door office mates in the Rainier building for the last three years or so. Um, it is, if you've never been to Ted's office, you really should swing by sometime. <laughs> It is, they, they save the biggest for the best. It is an absolutely gorgeous office, and he deserves it, rightly so. Um, he uh, actually graciously had a pizza party for all of us in the uh, little faculty pod there, and we all fit, so that proves how big it was, because <laughs> we and all the pizzas made it in there just fine. Um, something that you might not know is that Ted was also actually my organic chemistry instructor when I was a student here at Pierce a couple years ago, and, um, and I still have the lecture notes. I saved them. I will never get rid of them. They remind me how much I learned from him that year, and I also learn a ton from him every day, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Um, I know Ted to be a dedicated professional colleague, a supportive mentor in many ways. Uh, he is an inspired, amazing instructor. I know that firsthand. And he is truly a wonderful person. And because of that, it is really my honor to present him tonight to you, our distinguished faculty at Pierce College, Ted Wood. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, I have a present for you. Oh, well, you do? I'm getting another gift. Yeah. This looks a little awkward, but Ted loves to ride his bike, so I made you a little goodie bag of bicycle stuff. Cool. It's like a new flasher, a water bottle, stuff like that. Excellent. Hope you Excellent. like it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. <laughs> I already gave you the check. <laughs> Thank you for coming, everybody. I appreciate it very, very much. I really appreciate the bow ties. Well done. <laughs> well done. It's pretty cool. We've got administrators, staff, faculty, former faculty, a couple of students of mine, former students, former colleagues. Um, I appreciate it very, very much, and thank you all for coming. Last and anti-least, I got to thank my bride, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> we can talk about the love stuff later, honey. <laughs> but for now, I got to tell you, you're the most caring, the most compassionate, the most passionate, the most student-centered, the most creative, and the most effective teacher I've ever known. It's been wonderful for me to have such an inspirational in-house role model. <laughs> Most of us don't get that opportunity. I do. Okay, what am I going to talk about? A healthy relationship with science, which I'm guessing most of you don't have. <laughs> and quite frankly, even most of my science colleagues, I bet you don't have. At least, as I would define it, and I'm on the stage tonight, so I get to define it. <laughs> I go to a party. I chit-chat with people. How you doing? The usual sort of stuff. Eventually, what do you do comes up. Of course, what they mean is, what's your job? I say, I teach. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Everybody can relate to that. Teddy teaches. That's good. The next question, eventually, what do you teach? I say chemistry. <laughs> no, Ralph, that's not what happens. <laughs> Somehow that's a conversation stopper. It's like, oh, you're a Martian, are you? I guess that means we have nothing in common. I don't get this sometimes. I get this virtually all the time. It's bothered me forever. So tonight, I'm going to whine a little bit. 
I want people to have a healthy relationship with science. I want people to talk to me like they talk to anybody else. I want people to sit around the dinner table and talk about science things. People will bloviate about economics anytime they want to. <laughs> okay, Tom. <laughs> How many economics conversations have you had with people that know about that much? I hear you. I hear you. People can know that much about economics and they'll bloviate. Some of those people we call senators. <laughs> but people won't bloviate about science. They just feel intimidated. And don't. Don't. So I'm going to do a little whining. I'm going to make some behavioral suggestions. <laughs> I'm going to talk about underappreciated aspects of science. Scientific polls. We just finished a political season. A scientific political poll. Really? That term has always bothered me. I spent literally a couple hours just on the internet reading everybody's definition of a scientific poll that I could find, trying to find someone who could show me how it was in any way scientific. It is not scientific. I am not disparaging political polls. I am just wondering why they have to call them scientific. I think the reason has to do with people's general attitudes towards science. They're afraid of it. When you're afraid of something, you either dislike it, or you dismiss it, or you deify it. And I think people are calling political polls scientific polls when they really mean legitimate polls. What they really mean is statistically significant polls. What they really mean is well-designed polls. They are not scientific. But the adjective scientific is used because somehow in people's minds, that which is scientific is good, that which is non-scientific is bad. Now, I'm not, I'm not about to say that science isn't good stuff. I will never say that. But other things are good too. Allow yourself to believe that other things are good. Allow yourself to believe that it doesn't have to be scientific to be legitimate. As soon as I click on this next slide, some of you will immediately recognize what's going on. <laughs> Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. The original Ghostbusters. I bet some of you even know what specific clip this is. Some of you even know the line that's coming. <laughs> For those of you who aren't familiar with the movie, um, it's, you know, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, who isn't in the picture here. Um, it's a comedy about, you know, people that fight ghosts in New York City. And what's going on here is uh, there had just been a big uh, paranormal event in the New York Public Library. And Bill Murray and his team are coming in to interrogate Alice the Librarian here who's lying down because she had just seen the ghost. And there's a classic line in here. Uh, are you habitually using drugs, stimulants, alcohol? No. No, no, just asking. Are you, Alice, menstruating right now? What has that got to do with it? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. <laughs> I... <laughs> I remember when that movie first came out, me and my science buddies, that was kind of our catchphrase. Back off, man, I'm a scientist. <laughs> Why is that funny? Why is that funny? Back off, man, I'm a historian. <laughs> Even back off, man, I'm an economist. That wouldn't get the laughs that that got. Back off, man, I'm a scientist. I didn't hear that, Michelle. Was that good or that I didn't hear it? <laughs> Do you think the writers of this movie were making fun of scientists? 
I don't think so. I think they were making fun of people who make fun of scientists. <laughs> I think they were making fun of people's attitudes towards scientists. And it's a funny line, because people do have unhealthy attitudes towards scientists. So the line works for that reason. Let's make fun of politicians, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> That's always a good gig. Before anybody accuses me of anything, I'm going to make fun of a right-leaning politician with the above quote, and I'm going to make fun of a left-leaning politician with the below quote. So I'm being neutral here in that regard. I'm sure many of you re uh, remember a, a little while back Marco Rubio was interviewed and he said the earth is 6,000 years old and when pressed on that he said I'm not a scientist how can I be expected to know how old the earth is two plus two equals four well I don't know I'm not a mathematician We were at war with Germany in the 40s? Oh, I don't know. I'm not a historian. <laughs> you can't get away with that and anything else, but somehow you get away with it. I'm not a scientist. So that allows you to say things that are clearly inappropriate to say. Um, it, you know, he was, it doesn't bother me that he was obviously pandering for votes. I mean, he got a lot of backlash for that, and a few days later he gave some interviews, that made, and he made it perfectly clear that he understands that the Earth is four and a half billion years old that he doesn't believe that the earth is, is 6,000 years old. But on some level, he felt that he had to say that. And I understand pandering for votes. That doesn't bother me. I, mean, I guess it does bother me. <laughs> but, but I understand that politicians do it. I understand that they almost have to do it. it it's our fault collectively why they have to do it. Um, but what really bothers me is that somehow he felt that he could defend it by saying, I'm not a scientist, as if that was a license to be ignorant. That is not healthy. I'll bet some of you know who this bottom quote is from. <laughs> Michelle's bowing her head. She doesn't want to say. <laughs> yeah, Al Gore. Um, Al Gore is, obvious, as I'm sure all of you know, a big proponent of uh, that we need to do something about climate change. And one thing that he says frequently is, the science is settled. No, it's not. <laughs> the science is never settled. There is no such thing as settled science. It's an impossibility. <laughs> science never settles anything. Science provides evidence. I'm sure what he meant was something along the lines of the, the majority of scientists agree. Or he meant something along the lines of the preponderance of the evidence says. Well, why didn't he say that? He said the science is settled. The science is never settled. Let's go to ancient Greece. It's our boy Aristotle up there. Here's a couple of formal syllogisms. <laughs> Just a fancy word for a formal argument. I chose the name Felix because I was thinking about putting this up there and Linda and I were watching uh, an old uh, Odd Couple rerun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you always, you, <laughs> you always want to pick a name where you figure no one in the audience has it. <laughs> so, so, so you can make fun of it. Um, and the very next day, Felix Hernandez signed his new mega contract with the Mariners. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, there's a sign. <laughs> Felix is our boy here. Let's look at this top syllogism, formal argument. In a syllogism, the idea is that the first statement is a premise that is accepted, the second is accepted, and the third is something that is deduced from the first two, logically drawn from the first two. So Felix likes pizza. We're accepting that. That person is Felix. Therefore, that person likes pizza. Is that true? Yeah. Always? Necessarily so? What do you mean, no? 
if we accept the top two, given that Felix likes pizza, given that that person is Felix, that person likes pizza. There's no way that can be false. <laughs> what have we learned up here, though? <laughs> we already knew that Felix likes pizza. We've learned diddly. <laughs> Philosophers call that a valid argument, or sometimes they'll call it a perfect argument. And a lot of people think that's how science progresses, by these sorts of absolutely logical, can't be incorrect sort of argument. Let's take the bottom one. Felix likes pizza. That person likes pizza. Therefore, that person is Felix. Is that true? Can it be true? It could be, but it isn't necessarily true. Philosophers like to call this an invalid argument. By invalid, they mean not that it's wrong, but it isn't necessarily right. Or they'll call it an imperfect argument, an imperfect syllogism. This is science. This is how science progresses. Via imperfect syllogisms. Via invalid arguments. This alone would be insufficient evidence to establish that we're dealing with Felix. We would need a second syllogism. Felix is, or Felix has a tattoo on his arm. That person has a tattoo on his arm, therefore that person is Felix. Maybe, maybe not. But we're getting closer to Felixness. <laughs> How about, you know, Felix is six feet tall, that person is six feet tall, therefore that person is Felix. Okay, we've got six feet tall, tattoo on his arm, likes pizza. We're getting closer. That's how science proceeds, by building up evidence in this way, via Ill, imperfect, invalid syllogisms. We eventually can get ourselves to the point where we have sufficient evidence, I really like the way the legal people talk, preponderance of the evidence, or beyond a reasonable doubt for things that we're really sure of, via invalid syllogisms. We can get ourselves to the point where any reasonable person, as the judge tells the jury, would decide that that's Felix, but there's always the possibility that it's not Felix. There's always the possibility that you're executing an innocent person. There's always the possibility that you've got a scientific concept that is simply incorrect as a result of a series of invalid syllogisms. A healthy relationship with science requires that we all appreciate that it proceeds via invalid, imperfect syllogisms. A little chemistry for you. Most of you he says, hopefully, <laughs> are familiar with John Dalton's atomic theory. <laughs> this is the 21st century, people. I can talk about everything is composed of little tiny things called atoms, and you all are going to say, okay. Actually, John Dalton wasn't the first to talk about the fact that everything is composed of little tiny things called atoms. It was first proposed back in ancient Greek times. A couple of folks, Democritus and Leucippus, first came up with the idea and in fact, the word atom comes from a Greek word, atomos, meaning indivisible. You can take matter and boom, 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 break it down. You get the smallest little piece. That's an atom. But Democritus and Leucippus, all they did was find themselves a Bodhi tree to meditate under, ingest whatever psychoactive substance was in vogue at the time, <laughs> and said, hey, man, I got a cool idea. Maybe everything is composed of little tiny things called atoms. Wow, good idea. <laughs> and there it sat for literally thousands of years until somebody presented evidence for the concept. That's why John Dalton is spattered all over the textbooks, and Democritus and Leucippus get a little historical subnote. Okay, let's make sure we understand the three major tenets of this. Atoms can't be created or destroyed. Oops. Calm down. All atoms of a given element are identical. 
That means every oxygen atom is like every other oxygen. Calm down, Beth. We're, <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there, my friend. We're getting there. <laughs> Actually, Beth's in the process of making my point for me, so that's, so that's good. The third one, chemical reaction is simply the union and or separation of this atoms. When a chemical reaction occurs, you have the same atoms that were there at the beginning. Those same atoms are there at the end. They've just like bonded to different guys. You don't have any new guys. You haven't lost any guys. They just <laughs> shuffle. It's in every introductory textbook that's ever been written since John Dalton first proposed it, early 19th century. With Beth staying quiet, That first one, is it true? No. No. <laughs> Early 19th century, people. It can't possibly be true now. Science is progressive. That's one of the most beautiful things about science. We build. Nothing from the early 19th century is true now. All atoms of a given element are identical? Of course not. That's not true. Chemical reaction is simply the union and a separation of these atoms? Of course not, that's not true. The remarkable thing is that this is still true enough that we put it in textbooks. <laughs> it's still actually quite useful. Atoms can't be created or destroyed. We're all familiar with nuclear processes. The big periodic table that was in the, the wine room, all the elements beyond uranium, there's a bunch of them now. They've all been synthetically created in our laboratories, never found in nature. We can create atoms. We don't have to go to nuclear explosions or nuclear reactors. Any radioactive substance, which has been here since forever, radioactive decay is an identity atom-changing process. All atoms of a given element are identical? No. Even the non-chemists among you have heard of carbon-14 dating, for example. You probably know that there are different isotopes of carbon. Those are carbons. They're all carbons, but they are not identical. They are similar in very important fundamental ways, but they are not identical. Chemical reaction is simply the union and or separation of these atoms. Not nuclear processes. There's a whole lot more going on than the union and separation of these atoms. What's my point? <laughs> A healthy relationship with science appreciates, now I know that's not a measurable outcome, but I'm saying it anyway. <laughs> Terry liked that one. A healthy relationship with science requires an appreciation that science is progressive. Of course there's going to be nothing in the early 19th century that we would consider true today. Can't say that with all sorts of other fields. In fact, if I'm remembering my next slide correctly, and I am, let's contrast that. No, oh, oh no, I'm a slide ahead of myself. I'm a slide ahead of myself. Let's go here. This is a fun one. It's a couple of handsome gentlemen. <laughs> you laughing, you're laughing at me or Charlie up there? <laughs> On the right is Charles Darwin, the guy who, if you will, introduced us to the concept of natural selection. Considered one of the most important thinkers on the planet ever. Buried in Westminster Abbey against his desires, against his family's desires. Even though he was a controversial figure at the time, um, he, even in his day, he was recognized as um, perhaps the most important scientific thinker on the planet. On the left, we have a slightly less hairy gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought long and hard about doing this because it sounds egotistical, but it's not. Who knows more about evolution and natural selection, the process? 
which of these two gentlemen? You know, sorry Chuck, but, but by a long shot, by a long shot, I know a whole lot more. And that's not just me, most of the people in this room, maybe even all the people in this room. If you have even just the simple concept of your chromosome pairs, one came from mom, one came from dad, if you understand that, you have a better grasp of being able, at least, to understand natural selection than, than Charles Darwin could have. Um, you know, if he, if he would you know, reform out of the ether and study up for a little bit, I have no doubt that he'll kick us all. Um, but from what he was available to him and what's available to us, it's hands down. I know more about how natural selection proceeds than he does. And no, that's not egotistical. <laughs> it's simply a statement of how science is progressive. A healthy relationship with science appreciates this progression. Okay, now, am I going where I thought I was going before? Yes, I am. I'm guessing somebody knows what this is. Very good, very good. These are some paintings. They range in age from about 10,000 to 50,000 years old. Found in caves in the Dordogne region of France. Pablo Picasso visited these things. Stood at them. Jaw dropped. And reportedly said, we haven't learned a thing in 12,000 years. <laughs> Can you imagine a scientist saying we haven't learned a thing in 12,000 years? What I'm afraid of now is that some of you are thinking that I'm disparaging art. I am in no way disparaging art. I am simply pointing out what science is about. Science is progressive. If someone were to give a presentation on this, they could turn this argument totally around. They could say, wow, 12,000, 15,000, 20,000 years ago, there were people, people making art every bit as stylistic as what we do now. Isn't that a wonderful connection? Not just, I mean, that's what art is good for, connections. We can make connections with our, our world and with other people, and we can make connections with something 20,000 years ago. How cool is that? And I'd be in the audience saying, yeah, that's way cool. But that's not science cool. That's not what science is. Science is progressive. No one's going to say we haven't learned a thing in 12,000 years. <coughs> with my Dalton's atomic theory thing, with my Felix thing, I was trying to emphasize that you know, science proceeds via invalid syllogisms. The word proof really should never be used in science. Science is incapable of proving anything. Science is capable of building up evidence, establishing things, but it can't prove anything, so don't ever expect it to, if you want a healthy relationship. But science can disprove things. Now's the point where maybe I pick on some religious people. Sorry if I'm picking on you. But the whole creation argument, creationism thing. I'm someone who has no problem with that. I actually have absolutely no problem with someone believing in standard creationism. I have a huge problem with people calling it creation science. People can believe what they want to believe and I'm okay with it. But while science is incapable of proving anything, you can disprove. If we ever found mammalian fossils in Cambrian deposits, for the non-geologists in the crowd, the Cambrian era was well before mammals showed up on the planet. There are no mammalian fossils in the Cambrian deposit. 
if we found mammalian fossils in the Cambrian deposits, evolution is done. Show's over. We can show that up there. We can say, here is how you can disprove. Find me some fossils of mammals in Cambrian sedimentary deposits, and I will acknowledge that the game's over. Creationists, there's nothing that there's nothing like that that they can point to and say, this is how we can end the argument. This is how we could end evolution as a concept. Unless you can point to something and say, this can end it, it's not science. A healthy relationship requires you to be able to point to something that can end it. I guess I already started there. <laughs> I debated long and hard whether I should even talk about this. And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> I'm one, and I know a lot of people disagree with me on this, on both sides. I'm one that sees zero conflict. I just don't. Maybe I should say zero necessary conflict. There are conflicts all the time. When people talk science and religion, stupid things happen. <laughs> people talk about them in ways that are inapplicable. They talk about religion and try to bring science into it in ways that just don't mesh. They talk about science and trying to bring religion into it in ways that just don't mess, mesh. Science deals with the physical world. Religion deals with whatever religion deals with for you. But science deals with the physical world. As long as we keep that distinction, life is fine. Life is fine. Um, I'll take this a step further. And, you know, the whole does God exist phenomenon. Does science say God doesn't exist? Science is incapable of that. Science does not have anything intelligent to say with respect to the existence or non-existence of a deity. That's the end of that. I really like what Stephen Hawking has to say about it. Stephen Hawking, famous physicist in, 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 in Britain, um, he basically said that you know, science is, is, is incapable of, of commenting on the existence of a deity. However, science is capable of suggesting that maybe it's not necessary. Another science and religion thing that bugs me, my mom, she, no, 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 no. She, she, she doesn't bug me. <laughs> I love my mom. I love her husband, Chuck. Um, for Christmas, they sent us a subscription to a, a hardcore right-wing magazine. Um, my mom, politically, was left of me until about 15 years ago, then whoop, she did one of these numbers. Um, anyway, the very first article, and I, I read it, the very first article and the very first issue that came to me was one of these articles about a scientific basis for things that happened in the Bible. Who cares? <laughs> this article went at length to demonstrate that there could have been a flood of major magnitude. Granted, of course there could have been a flood of major magnitude. This article went at length to explain that the Red Sea could have gone dry. Of course seas can go dry. My buddy here, Les, and I, I'm sure you remember this, it was about 15 years ago, we paddled our kayaks in the town of Nisqually. You know, right up to people's windows. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> they, <as, laughs> should have been there, Michelle. It was fun. <laughs> um, it had been major rains. They released the dam. Um, the whole town got flooded out. You know, if, that, if I experienced that, surely over the many thousands of years of human history that has happened on a much grander scale than that, my issue with that is 
Why do people feel the need? Why do people feel the need to justify something that they feel religiously to justify it with science when there's really no connection? Why? In my mind, they're deifying science. And that's unhealthy. Don't do it. Science talks about material, practical, physical things. Don't deify it. Respect it, but don't put it on any sort of pedestal. Don't feel that you need science to justify your religious beliefs. Enjoy your religious beliefs. Appreciate them. Don't ask science to justify them. That's unhealthy. So says me. And I got the stage. Here's another cool thing about science. We don't understand much. There's a lot going on that we just don't understand. And that's cool. There are a lot of observations that we make. We can see what's going out in the world. We know that this is what happens in our particular universe, but we can't explain it. Be comfortable with ignorance. I love it with my, when my students, I have a couple of my students here tonight, Appreciate them coming very much. I love it when my students ask me questions that I can't answer. And I love being able to tell them, I don't know, I don't think anybody knows. That doesn't make it any less true just because we can't explain a phenomenon. If it's out there, if it's observable, it's real. Some of you know what this is. It's a diffraction pattern. It happens to be of, of light. We're going to get a little bit technical here. Not too technical. We do have administrators in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of wave particle duality. Everyone knows what a wave is. Terry knows what a wave is. Michelle knows what a wave is. Yeah. <laughs> One, you know, basically waves are propagations of energy. They are not material things, they are propagations of energy. If you think about the wave that you're most familiar with, a water wave, if you're out there on your little boat or something and a wave comes along, what happens to you and your boat? You don't move along with the wave. Hello. <laughs> you, don't move, <laughs> you don't move along with the wave unless you're where the wave breaks, that's a different phenomenon. But you just kind of go up and down. The energy is what's going forward, the material substance isn't. Wa energy, uh, waves are an energy phenomenon. One of the most characteristic, or the most characteristic property of waves is that waves can interfere with each other. What is meant by that is that, again, if you think of a water wave, there is a crest, there's a trough as it moves along. If two different waves come to the same place and meet crest to crest, they add on to each other and you get a wave that's even bigger than the individual waves. If two different waves come together and they meet crest to trough, they add on to each other. So like a positive wave and a negative wave and the wave ends up wiping out. That is an extremely unusual phenomenon. Only waves do that. You can have a wave, and a definite wave, observable wave coming from here. You can have another definite wave, observable wave coming from here. Yet where they meet, there can be no wave if they happen to meet crest to trough. You've all been out in little boats, and you know, you're sitting there in a gentle day. Ooh, here comes a wave. Ooh, here's another one. Isn't that nice? You're expecting another one, and kind of nothing happens. It's not like all of a sudden the wind died or anything. Destructive interference, there was no wave. Or, ooh, there's a wave. Ooh, there's another one. Ooh, there's a big one. <laughs> it's not like all of a sudden the wind kicked up again. Constructive interference where they build onto each other. Next time you're in the bathtub with a friend and can't think of anything better to do, 
you get, you get on one end, put your friend on the other end, make some waves. You can be making waves here, and if you, it takes a little work to do the timing. You can, you're, you can be sending waves towards the center of the tub, your friend is sending waves towards the center of the tub, and if you adjust the timing so that they meet crest to crest, you're going to have a wave in the middle of the tub bigger than anything you made or your friend made. You can readjust the th- I'm giving Terry ideas. You, you can readjust the timing so that you are definitely sending waves to the center of the tub. Your friend is definitely sending waves to the center of the tub. But if they meet crest of one to trough of the other, there's calmness in the center of the tub. Only waves do this. Here's an example. This is actually light, but let's talk about it in terms of electrons because subatomic particles do the same sort of thing. They behave as waves. You can take a couple of electrons, send them through... Actually, here's something even weird. You can only just take one electron send it through a couple of slits, and it goes through both slits. <laughs> because electrons are waves. What this represents, kind of a dark spot, is representing where two electrons, I assume we're okay with me saying the word electron, little tiny, tiny subatomic particles, <laughs> two electrons can hit, and if they happen to hit crest to crest, then you're going to see them. And in fact, you're going to see more electronness than you sent towards this piece of paper or this detector or whatever it is as they add on to each other. And in here in the middle where there's darkness, yes, electrons are hitting this spot, but you see no electrons because one is hitting at a crest and the other is hitting at a trough. So even though electrons are hitting it from here and electrons are hitting it from here, when they get there, there's nothing there. Does this concept feel good to you? (laughs) If you're a normal human being, it should not feel good. (laughs) Appreciate being ignorant. Science humbles us in this way. Let's take it a step further. So electrons are definitely waves because they do this sort of pattern. Undeniable. The evidence is here. It is major. This is not Fred Likes Pizza. This is major evidence. Electrons are also, however, particles. They are little tiny things, every bit as particulate as anything else, just small. They have a measurable mass. You can shoot them at things. You can put something in their way, like a pinwheel, and it'll turn the pinwheel. They are undeniably particles. They are undeniably waves. Waves are not particles. Particles are not waves. If we can't understand that, it's only because our brains are too small. And that's okay. A healthy relationship with science means appreciating that our brains are often too small. Allow that to happen to you and be okay with it. If I had a book, I meant to bring a book, I didn't bring a book. If I had a book up here, how would we know that it's a book? We would identify it as a book because it would have the properties of a book. It would have a cover, it would have some pages, it would have some words, it would have the properties that we have identified as belonging to a book. If that book would all of a sudden jump off off the table, start flapping and go quack, 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 we'd call it a duck. because it would have the properties of a duck. We would acknowledge that it is a different sort of duck, or it is a different sort of book. We'd call it a book duck. (laughs) But it would, we couldn't deny its existence if it was something observable. Our inability to reconcile the two is simply our inability to reconcile the two. Allow yourself to believe in book ducks. If, if, the observational evidence is there. I got one last thing for you. I'm not getting too many giggles on this. <laughs> Most of you don't know this. 
Yeah. Of course. Of course you know Dr. Science. No, Michelle, no Dr. Science? Um, a radio show. Oh, gosh, it's escaping my mind. What, what's the name of it, honey? The Duck Breath Theater. Thank you. Yeah, Duck Breath Theater. It used to be all over PBS. Um, the interesting thing about this, I think what relates to what I'm trying to say, is not like the four jokes that are in the middle, um, but the lead in and the lead out. Whoop, I can't do it with this. It's time once again to Ask Dr. Science. So let's ask Dr. Science. That's me. Remember, he knows more than you do. That's right. Now here's a potpourri of easy answers to easy questions. First from Paul Saunders, who writes from the University of Alabama. Dear Dr. Science, I learned from your program that the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. What is the speed of dark? Since dark is broken light, it doesn't have any speed at all. It just sort of sits around the house until we can find the switch. Next from William Kane in Boulder, Colorado. Dear Dr. Science, are cyclotrons good for making popcorn? No, but they make a great chocolate shake. Laura Hansen from Iowa City writes, Dear Dr. Science, do you have to patent a cow before you can have patent leather? Merely copywriting the cow is enough. Simply mail the cow to yourself in a self-addressed stamped envelope. When the cow arrives, don't open it. This is legally binding in most states. Finally, from Kim, John, Minga, and Don from Swan Lake, Montana, how come I can't look at the sun without sneezing? You're probably allergic to photons. Consult a physician or a physicist immediately, and let me know how you're doing. Dr. Science cares. Thank you, Dr. Science. Send your science questions to Ask Dr. Science. Remember, he's not a real doctor. I have a master's degree in science. <laughs> Whoop. Copyrighted cartoon, it's gone. <laughs> I used to love that show. Um, would Ask Mr. Economist work? Would, would Ask the Historian work in a funny way? Would Ask the English Teacher work in a funny way? Ask Dr. Science works. It works because people have a weird relationship with science. The whole notion of, I know more than you do, is comical because a lot of people think of scientists that way. I know more than you do. <laughs> it results from an unhealthy relationship with science. That's why it's funny. Because most of us have an unhealthy relationship with, with science. That's what makes it work. Okay, absolutely, lastly, I put Hillary. Thank you. Look at what Hillary did. Oh, Hillary, I love you. Oh, I know my husband did it. Nick. Hi. What's, uh, what's your name? <laughs> Nick. Look at what Nick did. <laughs> I put a molecular model set on everyone's table, running my own little Ted Wood secret psychological experiment. My prediction was that no one would do anything with them. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> you guys played over there? What's that? Oh, good. 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 Two tables worth. Okay, I'm sorry for picking on administrators. <laughs> okay, we have some action over here, too. Good. Good for you guys. Okay, so I'm only partially right. Okay, you guys played? Excellent, thank you, thank you. You made some water? <laughs> cool, cool. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you guys are surprising me. Good for you. My prediction was that you'd be afraid of them. My prediction was that you'd see that it said organic chemistry model kit, and most of you would somehow see that as something that you couldn't mess with. You know, had it said art supplies, you know, or had it even just said model kit, or had it said balls and sticks. 
that most of you would open it up and played with it. But with having it say organic chemistry, most people would look at something like that and say, that's not for me. I'm afraid of that. Good for you, those of you who have a healthy enough relationship with science that you're willing to open it up and play. Thank you all for coming. Quiz tomorrow.